Moses trusted in God's timing. Moses trusted in God's plan. So like Moses, you and I are called to faithfulness over results. Oh, I've had to learn that. Had to learn that. God calls me and you to faithfulness over results. Now, I'm not saying that God isn't all for results. He is. And so am I. And you ought to be. But God's plan doesn't always align with my plan. God's plan doesn't always uh, align with my expectations or your expectations or our timeline for things. No, we may not see the fruits of our labor immediately. But faithfulness means that we are trusting in God's timing, knowing that He is working behind the scenes in ways that I'll never know. He is doing things that I have no clue on. The journey matters as much as the destination. So are you willing to trust God's plan even when it doesn't make sense to you and you don't know where you are? Are you willing to stay faithful knowing that God's promises are sure even though you don't see the big picture yet? The Lord told Moses, go up to the, the Abram range to, the, to Mount Nebo in Moab across from Jericho, and view Canaan, the land I'm giving the Israelites as their own possession. All right, we need to push pause right there. Mount Nebo is a majestic mountain, soars over 3,000 feet high, located today in the country of Jericho. There's a picture taken from the top of uh, Mount Nebo. The text says it's across the Jordan River from Jericho in the Holy Land. Uh, er, um, Erhard and Kathy, others of you traveled to Israel with me, right? When we were standing at Masada, the fortress built by Herod, we could see Mount Nebo across the Jordan River. In fact, when you're standing on Mount Nebo, you can, on a clear day, you can see all the way to Jerusalem. In fact, you could see all the way to, to uh, the Sea of Galilee in the north, I'm told. I've not seen that, but others, others have. So this picture was taken at the top of Mount Nebo. Our own John DeLancey, Dr. John DeLancey, was standing right there this past week, and he's been posting them on his social media. If you don't subscribe to Dr. John Delancey's Facebook and YouTube channel, I invite you to do so. Spectacular pictures. Dr. Delancey's part of our Hillcrest family. He and his wife Sue have become part of our family, um, along with Sue's mom here in the past year or so. And, and he'll be preaching right here uh, two weeks from today. And then less than just, yeah, less than three weeks from now, he will be leading a fantastic seminar titled Bringing the Bible to Life on Friday, September 27th and, and Saturday, September, September 28th. Mark your calendars. Details are there in your bulletin. Dr. Delancey is author of two books. Um, he's led over 90 tours of Israel, of Jordan, of Egypt, of Turkey, of Greece, archaeological digs. I, I'm telling you, he's the real deal. And I'm so on, we are so honored to have him part of our church family. So, if you want to grow in the, your understanding of the culture of the Bible, of the archaeological context of the Bible, the, his, the geological and ge- geographical context of the Bible, you need to come to that, that uh, seminar. I'm telling you what, seminar is free, but you do need to register so we can plan. So you can do that. Those of you online, call the church office. We'll get you registered for that seminar. All right, back to our text. The Lord tells Moses to go to Mount Nebo, verse 50. The Lord said, there on that mountain you that you've climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Merida Kadesh, Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Therefore, you will see the land only from a distance. You will not enter the land I am giving to the people of Israel. Now, chapter 33 and verse 1. This is the blessing that Moses, the man of God, pronounced on the Israelites before his death. So he had a song, now we're going to have blessings. So I want you to try and picture what's going on here. Moses is approaching the end of his earthly days. And so he gathers together the 12 tribes of Israel, and he's going to affirm and speak blessing over each one of them individually. So the next 29 verses, Moses identifies each tribe's uh, unique strengths and abilities and history and responsibilities. And we don't have time to go through all 12 blessings. Uh, um, that, would, that would might be a whole sermon series. It'd be at least a whole sermon. Uh, but I want us to, to hit some highlights. So skip down to verse 7 with me, please. Let's look at the blessing on the tribe of, of Judah first. Moses says, Hear, O Lord, the cry of Judah. Bring him to his people. Now, the hymn there, obviously speaking of Judah, 
But Moses is affirming Judah as a leader, as one who would, was destined to unite and to lead them. But it's, he's also foreshadowing that from Judah, that tribe would produce kings. King David would come from the line, right? The family line of Judah. And of course, we know that the king of kings, right? The Lord Jesus Christ was from the line of Judah. Then Moses' blessing on the tribe of Levi follows, verses 8 to 11. We won't take time to read that, but, but he, he honors them and, and, and um, validates their role in, in preserving God's law and serving as priests. You understand that the, that the priests who served in the tabernacle, those who served in the, in the temple that would be built in Jerusalem, all came from the tribe of Levi. They were Levites. And so it, as... As important is that every tribe has a special or has a unique role. I mean, the tribe of Levi, I mean, this is core stuff. They, they were responsible for the worship of the people of God. And, and this is crucial for them to maintain their focus so that the spiritual health of the nation is, is maintained. Each blessing is individualized, it's special. Skip down to verse 12. Let's look at the Moses blessing on the tribe of Benjamin. About Benjamin, he said, let the beloved of the Lord rest secure in him, for he shields him all day long, and the one the Lord loves rests between his shoulders. This speaks God's, of God's loving care, of his protection, of giving Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin, the confidence that they would need, uh, that God is near, and that he would empower them to step into their future, and they need not fear. The Lord is with them. This, these, are, these are beautiful songs, but... but are, um, uh, blessings, but, but they're also strong prophetic declarations. That's what we've got going on here. Continuing on then in verse 13, we have Moses' blessing on the tribe of Joseph. Let's look at it. About Joseph, he said, May the, the Lord bless his land with the precious dew from heaven above and with the deep waters that lie below, with the best the sun brings forth and the finest the moon can yield, with the choicest gifts of the ancient mountains and the fruitfulness of the everlasting hills with the best gifts of the earth and its fullness. So Moses is just speaking prosperity and, and strength and saying Joseph's descendants, you know, look forward with anticipation to the blessings of the Lord, the, his faithfulness, his strength that, it, that's going to allow you to experience all of these blessings in the, the promised land. So one by one, as Moses is nearing the time of death, Moses speaks life. And he speaks blessing over the people of God, each tribe's future ahead. All right, well, that brings us to chapter 34, then in verse 1. And it says, Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. Now, that is a remarkable verse right there. Um, some of you bought this book and have been reading along with me. Chuck Swindoll has it absolutely right. He, he says, uh, the summit of Mount Pisgah reaches 4,500 feet. And I don't know too many 120-year-old men who could climb a mountain nearly a mile high and live to tell the story. Yeah, exactly. Right. Verse 2. There the Lord showed him the whole land from Gilead to Dan, all of the Naphtali, the Territory of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah as far as the western sea, the Mediterranean, the Negev and the whole region from the valley of Jericho, the city of Palms, as far as Zor. So this is Moses' final view, a glimpse of the promised land, and it's a 360-degree view that the Lord allows him to see. He begins by looking to the north and then to the west. If you trace outward the locations, we talked about north and then west and then to the south, and to the east. Verse 4, And then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. So this moment represents the culmination of decades of of leadership, of sacrifice, of unwavering faithfulness for Moses. And yet it's also a bittersweet moment because Moses knows he won't be entering the land for himself. And I'll remind you again that 
Moses wasn't allowed to enter the promised land because of his disobedience at Meribah. Pastor Steve, you preached on this a few weeks back, a whole, whole, week, whole message on this. The people were whining and complaining as they were prone to do. There was no water, so Moses was so fed up and so frustrated, he went and he, he whacked the stone instead of speaking to the stone as the Lord had told him to do. And so in frustration, he did not honor God, God's holiness and took some of the credit, what the Scripture makes clear, some of the credit for the water coming forth for himself. And as a result, God said to Moses, you will lead the people to the edge, but you're not going in the promised land. What a sobering reminder that is, that even for a tower of faith, you know, a great man of faith like Moses, right, there are consequences for disobedience. Our disobedience may cost us the very thing we desire most. Verse 5, And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab. As the Lord had said, he, he, the Lord, buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor. But to this day, no one knows where his grave is. Oh, lots of skip, speculation on this. And you say, what? what? Why, why would the Lord do that? Um, let's just say we don't need a second Mecca, right? Worshiping a grave. Yeah, I think the Lord knew better. Verse 7, Moses was 120 years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days, and the, till the time of weeping and mourning was over. So Moses' death marks the end of an incredible era and a beginning of a new era. era. Verse 9 says, Then Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom. Moses had laid his hands, conferred the blessing and his leadership on him. And the Israelites listened to him, to Joshua, and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Verse 10, Since then no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those miraculous signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And that, brothers and sisters, marks the end of our journey with Moses, our study of Moses, and brings us again to the morning, the moment of the morning when we ask our big question, so what? So what? Oh, you want to do it? Oh, I, okay, you're all rested up. I, I, you know, I debate sometimes. I, every now and then I get somebody say, you know, when are you going to move on? You know, so, so, so no, I try to mix it up and not do this every week, but you're rested up, you're back. On three, let's hear it. One, two, three. So, what? <laughs> oh, Craig Lassinger. He always playing with the toys. Always playing with the toys. Ha! All right, what is this song of Moses, his blessing on 12 tribes, and this panoramic view of the promised land have to do with you and me? Well, for the time that we have left, what I want to do is share, I'm going to try to bring this all together and share three, what I believe are three enduring lessons that we ought to be taking away. These are lessons for your life. These are lessons for my life and, and our work together. But before we go there, I told the first service, you, know, you may think I'm, I'm weird, and, and some of you obviously do. You obviously, yeah, I know you're weird, Pastor Mark, you're just weird. Um, but one of the things um, I did this week is I went, I, I do this, I won't say every week, but often, often, um, most weeks, I take a walk in a cemetery, or go to a cemetery. And one of the recurring thoughts I have is... Um, if I knew, like Moses, that I only had a few days left, what would I prioritize? What would I do? You ever think about those things? I stood with some, some guys here after rehearsal one night, and all of us are kind of ticking a little older, and we were sort of waxing eloquent about, you know, I just think about death a whole lot more. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think it's bad at all to think about death. Not, not a bad, but let, let me just ask you, if, if you knew, if you knew that Friday... This Friday was the day, and you're checking out. What, what, would, what would be priority on your list this week? I mean, would you go on a big vacation? Would you go, like, to Hawaii or maybe do an a African safari? Somebody um, maybe want to do that? Or how about skydiving in the Swiss Alps? That sounds thrilling. Not sure I'd have the courage to do it, but it sounds awesome. 
I'd like to see the Swiss Alps. Climb Mount Kilimanjaro, anybody? I mean, maybe that. Um, or maybe you go out to dinner with all your friends and family every night. Every night. Would you do that? Um, maybe throw a big party? How about, how about rent a, a red Ferrari or an orange Lamborghini, right? And just, just tool around town and don't worry about the tickets because you're not going to be around for the court date anyway, right? <laughs> I said to the first service, right? And all of us on a diet, right? Oh, that's totally done. We're down to Farm Fresh. Give us two boxes of donuts every day. Every day. Ah, seriously, what would be your number one concern if you knew you only had a few days to live. Uh, think about that. Now, some of us may be tempted to think of only temporal stuff, you know, things that are going to be here today and gone tomorrow along with us. Um, but Moses' life, do you understand? Moses' life calls us to think about bigger things, to focus on God and the bigger thing and things that he is doing. Moses' life was full of challenges, for sure, Full of some victories, yes, absolutely, but a whole lot of failures and a whole bunch of whiners and a lot of that. And yet through it all, his faith in God's promises, it shaped not only his destiny, but the destiny of an entire nation. Can I say it, it shaped our destiny as we have been brought into the family of God. So here are three lessons from Moses' life that I, I've written down that I think ought to be and can be a roadmap for us as we begin a new ministry season this fall. And, and as we move forward into the future, as long as God gives us, right? Here's the first one. Number one, embrace the call. Embrace the call. Say this with me. God has a unique plan for my life. God has a unique plan for my life, right? From the mo moment of, of Moses' miraculous birth to his calling at, at the burning bush, Moses' life has been marked by God's hand on him. And although Moses felt unqualified for sure, you know, and, and very uncertain of himself. God had a specific mission for him to lead his people out of centuries of slavery in Egypt toward the promised land. Moses embraced that call, even when it seemed ridiculously impossible that it was ever going to happen. Now, some of you may be thinking, yeah, but I ain't Moses. And you're right, you aren't. You are not Moses and neither am I. But, get me, hear me, if you know Jesus... If you know Jesus right, God has a unique plan for your life. Say that again. God has a unique plan for my life. Say it again. God has a unique plan for my life. We may not feel adequate. We may feel unsure. But God calls us to step into His plans with boldness. See, it's not about our ability. It's not, not about you. It's not about your ability and what you bring to the table. It's not about my ability. It's about God. It's about embracing all that God has promised and trusting that God will enable us and empower us and equip us for what we need for the journey ahead. So the question is, will you embrace the call of God has placed on your life? It may require that you step out of the familiar. It may require that you do something you've never done before to step into God's purpose in ways that you've never done to a greater degree. Here's number two. Focus on faithfulness. Say this with me. I must trust God's plan and timing. I must trust God's plan and timing. Moses had plenty of moments of doubt and failure and frustration, constant complaining and whining. Oh, man, that would wear me right down fast. Yet despite the setbacks... Moses remained faithful to God's call, leading the people through 40 years through what the Bible describes as a, as a dry and weary, weary land. I've seen parts of it. It's dry. Ain't much going on there. It was a desolate place to be for 40 years. And so Moses didn't see immediate results. And he never even saw, in reality, the promised land for himself. But Moses trusted in God's timing. Moses trusted in God's plan. So like Moses, you and I are called to faithfulness over results. Oh, I've had to learn that. I had to learn that. God calls me and you to faithfulness over results. Now, I'm not saying that God isn't all for results. He is. And so am I. And you ought to be. But God's plan doesn't always align with my plan. 
God's plan doesn't always uh, align with my expectations or your expectations or our timeline for things. No, we may not see the fruits of our labor immediately, but faithfulness means that we are trusting in God's timing, knowing that He is working behind the scenes in ways that I'll never know. He is doing things that I have no clue on. The journey matters as much as the destination. So are you willing to trust God's plan even when it doesn't make sense to you and you don't know where you are? Are you willing to stay faithful knowing that God's promises are sure even though you don't see the big picture yet? Number three, invest in the next generation. Say this with me. People need Jesus. People need Jesus. People here in our area need Jesus. People around our country need Jesus. People around our world need Jesus. In fact, of the 8.1 billion people on the planet today, do you understand that more than 40% of them have yet to hear or to embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's over 3.25 billion people. That's unacceptable. And it's unacceptable not just because I say it, but because God says it. He's not willing that any would perish. He's given us a commission. He sent us for it to every tribe and language and nation. We're, we're to take the gospel to the nations. 